Hello and welcome to the VideoLabs Academy. In various lectures in the VideoLabs Academy, I covered the fundamentals of optics and why lenses are made the way they are. I explained the meaning of the f-stop and its influence on the depth of field. I also explained the very little known effect of diffraction through the so-called airy disks, which deteriorates the image quality of sensors with small pixels and which in CCTV are tackled by the introduction of ND spot filters and now uh, lately the P iris. Interestingly enough, uh, the latter two concepts of the ND spot filter and P iris are really unique in the optics of CCTV. And to the best of my knowledge, they do not appear in any other imaging industry, not in photography, not in cinematography, not in any videography that uses uh, lenses. But there are some more unique aspects of CCTV lenses, and in this video lecture, I will cover the types of lenses we have in our industry based on how the iris works and also based on their focal length. I will also explain how to determine the angles of view on various sensor sizes, various focal length, and I will show you some tools for finding these angles. I will also give you some practical examples. So, uh, based on how the iris works, the aperture, we have two divisions of lenses. Manual iris controlled lenses, or short MI, and auto iris controlled lenses, or AI not to be confused with artificial intelligence. So we've got manual iris and auto iris. The manual iris lenses are simply lenses where the iris is controlled manually by human, typically an operator or an installer. Uh, and this can be manually adjustment of the iris during the camera installation process, or it can be remotely done uh, by the viewer or an operator uh, which accesses the camera, uh, typically now via the network. If the lens iris is manually set up, and once it is set, it stays like that. So manual iris lenses do not change the iris during operation. They are fixed at whatever position uh, they are set to, to stay. But there are lenses that have no iris mechanism also, but only fully open iris design, such as the so-called board cameras use such lenses. So if you see board camera in a lens, there is hardly space to put any uh, auto iris leaves. It's simply fully open. Small cameras with, inter with integral lenses, which cannot be removed nor adjusted, would also use such lens with no adjustable iris. Such cameras can be considered to have manual iris, although in this case with no control over the iris, but always fully open, but they still can be classified as MI, manual iris lenses. Exactly the same iris concept with no control, fully open, um, is on most modern smartphones and pads, smart pads. They do not have any mechanical iris adjustments, but rather they're always fully open iris. Now if you remember what I said about the diffraction effect via the so-called airy disk in one of the previous lectures, you will find that this is actually uh, fully open iris is a good solution for sensors with small pixels, such as the smartphone sensors, for example. They, they have a pixel size of less than 1.5 micrometers, typically 1.2, maybe 1.4, but that means they are very much dependent on the f-stop. Uh, such small pixels require large opening or low f-stop number in order to have sharp image. So typically this is what smartphones, for example, have. If you have paid attention or read the specifications, typical f-stop on a smartphone would be f1.8 or maybe f2.2. And by the design itself is made to have as good optics as possible, uh, which then by combined with lack of airy disk effect, so lack of diffraction effect because the iris is fully open, we've got quite a good quite a good quality picture. Uh, so this is a lens that can be put in the group of manual iris lenses. Now, if the lens has a remotely adjustable iris, uh, these are lenses which have little iris motors inside, which can be controlled by an operator remotely. 
This means the viewing software or system has to have controls with which one could open or close the iris depending on their judgment. As we all know, the opening and closing of the iris controls the amount of light incident on the sensor, which as a result produces sharper and better video. Now, the auto iris lenses are lenses with electronic circuitry and a little iris motor inside the lens itself, which opens or closes the iris depending on the automatic feedback from the camera electronics. There are two types of AI or auto iris lenses, uh, video driven and DC driven. DC stands for direct current, so either video driven or DC driven lenses. In the past, during the analog times, most common were the so-called video driven AI lenses. Video driven uh, auto iris lenses were simply fed by the camera with a video signal which is then processed by the lens electronics and based on the video level, the lens decides to open or close the, close the iris depending upon whether the light is too strong or, or too low. So video driven auto iris lenses were typically more expensive uh, for the same optics compared to the DC driven lenses simply because uh, those lenses needed to have extra electronic circuitry uh, for processing the video signal. Also, Often the video driven lenses were going into oscillation or hunting, so called, due to interaction with the automatic gain control AGC circuitry of the camera, which was trying to adjust the video level but often in the opposite direction of the lens circuitry. So, if the setting on the video driven lenses, uh, which had usually two settings, like level and ALC, which is automatic light control. If these two uh, settings were out of uh, uh, normal working position, it was possible to create a feedback loop, like microphony in audio, if you wish, where the uh, lens constantly tries to adjust itself and suddenly you've got pulsating video or hunting video image that doesn't stop until you either change the position of the camera or obviously change some of the settings on the lens. So in a way, video-driven uh, lenses were a little bit more, let's say, risky because their uh, circuitry was completely independent of the camera and if they're not adjusted properly, they could cause such hunting or oscillation, which was not a pleasant effect to have. The DC-driven lenses are simpler and more reliable uh, for automatic iris control because they don't have any smart electronics to process the video but rather they leave this task to the camera electronics. So the camera processes the video signal levels and decides to open the iris if possible when the light levels are too low or perhaps instruct the iris to close if the light levels are too high. The instructions is in the form of DC voltage uh, being sent to the iris motor which is why these AI lenses are called DC-driven lenses. Most of the modern IPCCTV cameras with auto iris lenses use the DC-driven concept as this minimizes the cost of the lenses but also avoids hunting effect that I mentioned before which is present in the video-driven, could be present in the video-driven auto iris lenses. Now a subgroup of the DC-driven AI lenses are the so-called P iris lenses we spoke about those in the lecture about the f-stops. Just to summarize for students that have not studied this lecture, the P iris is a concept that tries to close the iris when there is sufficient light, but not to its maximum position, small opening of the iris, but to a position that sits somewhere in the middle section of the iris position, in order to avoid the diffraction effect of airy discs which appears with high f-stops. At the same time, the middle position of the iris opening achieves better optical sharpness as long as the pixel size of the sensor are bigger than the airy disc for that f-stop. I suggest you uh, view that lecture as well if you haven't uh, gone through it because it does explain some other uh, features of the, of the optics uh, of the lenses. A lens, in addition to the iris control, may also have manual and automatic focus control. This is a bit more modern function, 
but more and more uh, cameras, more and more lenses come with automatic focus control. The manual focus control is similar to uh, manual iris control, where an installer sets the focus once during the installation process and based on their judgment, what is the best sharpness for the given camera. So obviously they have to see the actual image of the camera, uh, look at their uh, viewfinder on the, on the monitoring device and actually set it up while viewing it. Automatic focus control is achieved by measuring the edges of objects in the projected image on the sensor, so it's done inside the camera, which voltage is fed back then to the motorized focus control of a lens and obviously with a reasonably quick um, action and uh, reaction with good feedback, it is possible to focus in reasonably quick time. So for a camera to have automatic focusing lens, it is necessary for the lens to have internal moving optical elements used for focusing, but also for the camera to have autofocus section which produces electric signal intended to drive the lens focus mechanism. Many modern IP CCTV cameras have web-based menus which can be accessed by an operator through which some fine adjustments of the focus and the area of interest can be, can be done, can be achieved. One point of interest when talking about manual and automatic focusing, and this is connected to the depth of field, which I already covered in the lecture about f-stops and depth of field, the visual indication of when best focus is achieved is during minimum depth of field. Uh, that is when the f-stop is minimal, so the eye is as open as possible. So a word of advice to installers is that they should try and adjust the best focus during lower light levels when the auto iris opens fully the iris. Because the depth of field is the smallest in such a case, it is much easier to see when best focus is achieved. If you try to do the same during bright sunny day, the camera would have closed the iris to the highest f-stop it can because it's a bright and sunny which would produce then white depth of field. And then in return, this makes almost everything appear sharp. Thus, adjusting the focus, be that manually or automatically, is more difficult to achieve when you have such a wide depth of field. So if there is no possibility of working in low light and you must commission the camera during bright sunny day, the best advice I can give you is to use an external neutral density filters, ND filters, and put them in front of the lens. By doing so, you will reduce the strong light to lesser values, which will force the iris to open and make your focus adjust easier. These ND filters are used in photography too, and they are reasonably easy to find. They are usually specified with the amount of light f-stop reductions or factorize there's 10 times, 100 times reduction of light intensity. You can obviously combine them. Uh, but if the light reduction is mentioned, remember that we said that every next f-stop reduced the amount of light passing through the sensor by a factor of 2. That is, if f8, for example, reduces the light coming from uh, compared to f5.6 by 50%. Uh, if you remember the f-stop numbers, uh, f8 comes immediately after f5.6. So f8 being higher number, next higher number to f5.6, uh, transmits half the amount of light than f5.6. And that was the idea behind the f-stops. So that means f5.6 transmits twice the amount of the light when comparing to f8. So if you are searching for an ND filter, and they usually would specify how many f-stops they reduce the amount of light. If they say uh, two f-stops, that means that the attenuation of light is by factor of four, two f-stops, because you, you're jumping from f5.6, one f-stop is f8, that's already uh, half. From f8, the next one is f11, so that's one quarter of f5.6, which is why I say that uh, if the ND filter is two f-stops, uh, then the, attenu the attenuation is four times. So 
F5.6 will reduce it to 50%, F8 will reduce to further 50%, and then you get to the F8, which is then four times less than 5.6. Basically, the anti-filter f-stops reduce the amount of light by two to the power of the number of f-stops. Now, uh, this is just, a, I'll, I'll put it in writing on the slide so you don't confuse it. Uh, this is a number of f-stops. This is not the f-stop number but how many steps of f-stop is reduction. That's what this number of f-stop refers to. So uh, the ND filters can also be found as a variable density ND filters. Like lately you can find uh, filters, circular filters, which look kind of like a polarizing filters in photography, if you, if you have heard of them. Now this is with two rings that can rotate uh, relative to each other and by doing so you can actually achieve continuous ND uh, reduction by certain f-stops and many of them would go let's say from one f-stop reduction up to five or six f-stops so if you have let's say ND variable ND filter that goes from uh, one f-stop to let's say five f-stops then the maximum uh, reduction of light you can get with that it would be 2 to the power of 5 because it's 5 f-stops, that's about 32 times, which is about 3%. So if you've got a normal um, bright day, not maybe too sunny, but 10,000 luxes reflected light, which is quite bright, if you put such a ND filter, you can reduce it down to 300 lux and to the camera, it will appear as if it is 300 lux because that's 3% of the um, 5 f-stop reduction and that will force the uh, iris of the lens to open up uh, which will produce shallow depth of field which will make your work easier to focus more obviously once you do that you lock up the, the actual uh, focus um, and you actually have done a proper commissioning where the focus is as good as it can be for that particular for that particular lens and uh, camera. Let's now talk about the types of lenses based on how they focus. We have the following division of lenses in CCTV based on their focusing. Fixed focal length lenses, very focal length lenses and zoom lenses. The fixed focal length lenses are, as the name suggests, lenses which only offer you one focal length. This is one field of view that cannot be changed. As we will see later on, the angle of view depends very much on the focal length, expressed in millimeters, but it also depends on the sensor size. One and the same focal length lens will have different angles of view on different size sensors. We will explain later on in more details why is that. Purely from optical point of view, fixed focal length lenses are easier to make as they have no optical moving parts other than the focusing mechanism and the iris, that is if they are auto iris lenses. But in addition, they also can be made with better optical quality because there are no moving optical elements. For accurate resolution, and testing of cameras, we will see later on in the lecture about the camera testing, it is always recommended to have a good quality fixed focal length lens. In photography and cinematography, fixed focal length lenses with best optical quality are called prime lenses. By definition and design, they would offer the best optical performances. In CCTV, however, we often cut corners, sadly, and want to make a system more attractive to the customer, so the so-called varifocal lenses have been introduced. Varifocal length lenses are lenses which have optical moving parts in order to change the focal length. This is usually done manually by way of moving two groups of optical elements until a desired and sharp view is obtained. Uh, the manual control on some cameras is done by electronic control of these two groups of optical elements. But the important fact is about varifocal lenses is that they are designed to have a range of possible angles of view which are set by way of moving some optical elements inside such a design. And once this is achieved and image focused to the optimum, 
the very focal length lenses is locked and set to be used in such a position as fixed focal lengths would. So in other words, very focal length is not for continuous usage of changing focal length during operation, but it is uh, more practical for setting up unknown coverage in an area and then once it's set up, locked up and set for fixed during the operation of the camera. The only problem here is that very focal length lens can never be as good as fixed lens simply because uh, they have too many moving optical elements. It is very difficult to make a lens where optical elements are mechanically loose for the purpose of achieving different angles of view and be at the same time precise and accurate. Optics doesn't like to be moved much unless the movement is precisely controlled relative to the other optical elements and relative to the optical axis. On the other hand, very focal length lenses are very practical as they offer a choice of multiple focal lenses in one piece. For this reason, very focal lenses have become very popular in CCTV. What about the zoom lenses? Well, the zoom lenses are a special type of lenses, which were designed to do what varifocal lenses are intending to do. They keep the optical elements in such a position that when the focal length is varying or the angle of view is changing, the image, once it is focused, stays focused at various positions. The zoom lenses were first designed and introduced back in 1932 by Bell and Howell, engineers, for a movie, but became very important and popular in television, early television days, which was using the so-called, until then, carousel type of lens design, which was used to change angles of view. They were basically, the cameras were basically rotating, the cameramen, I should say, were rotating a different fixed focal length lenses from a carousel of five or six size different lenses. This concept, though practical compared to manually changing the lenses, lacked continuity of the length selection and more importantly optical blanking was unavoidable when a selection was being made. Now that is why optical engineers had come up with a design for a continuous focal length variation mechanism which got the popular, popular name zoom. The zoom lens concept lies in the simultaneous movement of a few groups of lenses. The movement path is obviously along the optical axis, but with an optically precise and a non-linear correlation of the lenses between each other. This makes not only the optical, but also the mechanical design very complicated and sensitive. It has, however, been accomplished, and as we all know today, zoom lenses are very popular and practical in both CCTV and broadcast television, as well as in photography. Zoom lenses are much better than varifocal lenses because once focused, they always stay in focus assuming proper back focus adjustment has been made. Uh, for this reason, zoom lenses are more expensive than varifocal and of course than the fixed focal length lenses. I remind you, however, to remember the video lecture about the f-stops where we said that when zoom lens increases its focal length, the f-stop reduces. This ultimately means that when you zoom in, the amount of light falling on the sensor reduces dramatically at the same light levels. As we said in the same video lecture, the f-stop written on the lens itself always refers to the shortest focal length. That's very important to remember. For many perfectionists in photography, zoom lenses will never be as good as fixed ones. In the absolute sense of the word, this is very true because the moving parts of a zoom lens must always have some tolerance in its mechanical manufacture, which introduces more aberration than what a fixed lens design has. Hence, the absolute optical quality of a certain focal length setting in a zoom lens can never be as good as a well-designed fixed focal length lens of the same focal length that you achieve with the zoom lens. For CCTV applications, however, compromises are possible with good results. 
continuous variation of angles of view without the need to physically swap lenses is extremely useful and practical. This is especially the case where cameras are mounted in fixed locations, such as on a pole or on the top of a building, and the resolution requirements are not as critical as in the film or photographic industry. It should not be assumed, however, that in their evolution zoom lenses will not come very close to the optical quality of the fixed ones. Zoom lenses are usually represented by their zoom ratio. This is the ratio of the focal length at the telephoto end and of the zoom at the focal length at the wide angle area end. Usually, the telephoto angle is narrower than the standard angle of vision, which we mentioned in one of the lectures, which was 30 degrees angle of view. Uh, and the wide angle is wider than the standard angle of vision. Since the telephoto end always has a longer focal length than the wide angle, the ratio is a number larger than 1. In fact, today in CCTV, we've got 10 times, 20 times, even 30 times optical zoom. This is the ratio from the longest telephoto focal length to the shortest telephoto focal length. Okay, let's now go to the next topic, angles of view and how to determine them. A lens sees objects with the same angle of vision in all directions, horizontal, vertical, diagonal. That is, the angle of vision has a conical shape. Therefore, the image area projected by a lens has always circular shape. Although the camera sensitive area, a CCD or CMOS sensor for example, is a rectangle within that imaging circle. In the early days of analog television, as well as in the analog CCTV of course, the image sensitive rectangular area was with the aspect ratio of 4 by 3. Photographic sensors have typically aspect ratio of 3 by 2. And the new high definition television standard has an aspect ratio of 16 by 9, which is also adopted for the 4K television, the ultra high definition television, as well as for the upcoming 8K standard. The 16 by 9 aspect ratio is chosen in order to match the aspect ratio of many movies, which have the letterbox aspect ratio, and in order to impress the human vision better and offer better experience in watching movies. This is due to the fact that human perception with two eyes sees more horizontally than vertically. The very first CCTV cameras used imaging tubes of a certain diameter and they were referred to as 1-inch Vidicon or perhaps 2 3rd of inch Nubicon tube cameras. These dimensions referred to the actual diameter of the imaging tube. The lenses were designed to project an image circle with similar diameter as the tube itself. But the active imaging area was a rectangle inside such a projected circle with a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, smaller in its diagonal compared to the tube diameter. For example, a 1-inch tube has an imaging active area of 12.8 by 9.6 mm. The diagonal of such an imaging area with aspect ratio of 4 by 3 is 16 mm, which is way smaller than 1 inch, which is 25.4 mm. As we explained in the lecture about units of measurements, the CCD and CMOS sensors do not have the same meaning of the diagonal size as is the case in television screens. The imaging sensor sizes refers to the lens projected image circle that is designed for such a sensor, or what was in the past the imaging tube diameter. With the evolution of video technology from one tube cameras with one inch diameter, for example, to half inch or one third of inch CCDs, and today to CMOS sensors, we have such a variety of aspect ratio and a variety of pixel count sensors. At the same time, the industry decided to keep the same C and CS mount threads in CCTV, known as 1 inch 32 UN, referring to 1 inch diameter with 32 threads per inch. This means that modern CCTV lenses are designed to be compatible with various generations of cameras. But with the smaller imaging sensor sizes, the opportunity came for the lens manufacturers to make smaller and cheaper lenses, which projected only the size of a circle that is needed for the sensor type. 
In other words, a 6 millimeter lens, for example, designed for a sensor type 1 third of inch, would have a smaller projected circle, which may not cover the whole sensor of half inch, for example, which is bigger, although it uses the same thread, and it provides the same angle of view as 6 millimeter would offer on half inch sensor. There is no point, though, in making a lens that produces a much bigger imaging circle than what is required, as this would increase the size and the cost of the lens. Therefore, the lenses are made to suit the image format, no less and not much more. In fact, one of the important reasons for reducing the sensor sizes is the possibility to make smaller lenses, which will project smaller imaging circle and thus reduce the price of lenses. And because of such an evolution of imaging technologies, the switch from tube to solid-state CCDs and CMOS sensors, and later on from analog to digital, today in CCTV we have quite a few different imaging sensor sizes, which are expressed in inches like 2 third of inch, half inch, 1 third of inch, 1 quarter, 1 over 2 and a half inch, 1 over 1.9 inch, and so forth. Remember what we said in the very first lecture about the new initiative by ISO and the IEC standards that we should call these formats types. So we are really talking about sensor type 1 half, sensor type 1 over 2.5, 1 over 1.8, etc. So we now have a plethora of lenses which may have the same focal length but would provide different angles of view on different sizes sensors but also it is possible that some of them may have smaller or perhaps even larger projection circle. I will try to explain these differences later on. Technically, larger projection circle lenses can be used on smaller imaging sensors, providing the back flange distance to the sensor is as specified by the standards, 17.5 mm for C mount and 12.5 mm for the CS mount standards. Smaller projection circles lenses may not be suitable on larger sensors as they will have some cropping in the sensor corners. Different focal length lenses give different angles of view on the same imaging sensor size. Same focal length lens gives different angle of view on the different imaging sensor size. There are a variety of tools in our industry which will help you find the required angle of view both the horizontal and the vertical, and I will cover that. But first I would like to explain and illustrate a very simple formula, which is easy to remember and therefore easy to apply in practice with simple calculation using your smartphone. The diagram here shows you this formula and the parameters involved. All you have to remember is the sensor size of your camera. Everything else is pretty straightforward to calculate. Let's now work out an example with this simple formula. Let's assume we have a sensor type 1 over 2.8, which is to say this is 1 over 2.8 inch sensor, and the dimensions of such sensor is 5.4 millimeters by 3.38 millimeters. This you can find in various specifications of cameras with such a sensor. Let's assume we want to see an object at about 10 meters away from the camera and we want to see four and a half meters wide scene. This could be camera installed in a room, in a corner, and let's say we have a couple of doors coming into the room. We want to see all doors, the total width of which is four and a half meters, at 10 meters distance away from the camera. So what is the focal length that we require? Let's start from the formula that we already mentioned. Focal length is equal S times D divided by W. Now uh, just pay attention to the units. Now even though S is the width of the sensor, is in millimeters, you don't need to convert that to meters or inches simply because the other two units, D divided by W, are of the same type. As long as you keep the units of those two variables of the same kind, then they cancel each other out when they divide, and the focal length will be then in millimeters. So in our case, we use D to be in meters, W to be in meters, but equally you can work with in feet if you wish. 
the focal length will be in millimeters as we said this is the units of measurements for focal length so in our case the S is 5.4 millimeters this is the width of the sensor that we chose distance being 10 meters and width of what we want to see 4.5 meters if we replace them in the formula we get focal length required for that is 12 millimeters so what about the angle of view for most installers finding the focal length to see exactly what they want is sufficient but some projects may require that you know actually the angle of view horizontal or vertical from simple trigonometry we can actually find this angle by knowing the distance and the width of what we want to see uh, the angle alpha in our case for the horizontal angle of view would be 2 times arc tang which is inverse tangents of W divided by 2D and if we replace all the variables that we have which is for the width 4.5 meters distance we said is 10 meters we get alpha is actually 2 times 12.7 degrees which is 25.4 degrees so for the found focal length lens and a distance of 10 meters and 4.5 meters width the 12 millimeter lens on 1 over 2.8 type sensor will have horizontal angle of view of 25.4 degrees one more example I want to show you, uh, this time using the Videolabs calculator, the application that we've designed for iOS smart devices as well as for Android devices. So obviously if you look for Videolabs calculator on iTunes or the Google Play Store, you can download it and I believe it will be very useful for you. There are many more uh, parameters to calculate from this application but I will show you only the finding of the angle which we did manually now this is going to be done through simulated uh, calculation uh, of the of the Videolabs app this is the starting screen which is default with certain uh, parameters already in there the bottom blue windows represent the entry point where you need to enter the image sensor dimensions and for some further calculations which we are not interested at the moment like pixel count density and so forth we need to change the second blue window but in our case we will just choose the image sensor dimensions that is equal to the uh, sensor that we put in our example previously so we just basically change this to 1 over 2.8 inch sensor as you can see here now um, we have in this Videolabs calculator we've got all commercially available sensors so technically you don't need to worry about anything other than just knowing what sensor your camera uses and obviously what resolution you need to uh, use for calculating pixel density which we will explain later on in another video lecture but this is the starting point where you enter manually your uh, parameters uh, first of which being the image sensor now we did say in our example that we have distance to the scene about 10 meters so we'll set this up to 10 meters and as you can see everything uh, changes on on this right hand side as you change the distance now in order to um, lock the distance you need to hold it for more than a second and now you've got the focal length that you can change to give you the scene width or you can actually change the scene width as we said to four and a half meters so let's switch the scene width now to four and a half meters because that's what we want to see and the calculator will tell us what is the focal length so going to four and a half meters there we go so as you can see here on the left hand side the focal length is found to be 12 millimeters which is what we calculated manually and at the same time you can see the angle of view is also calculated to be 25.4 degrees which is also found manually now in our case 
if we are looking at 4 by 3 aspect ratio image, uh, which is indicated by this default setting, then the scene height is 3.38 meters. Uh, clearly, if we change this to be 16 by 9 aspect ratio, such as changing it to this, the scene height will change to 2.53 because the, we, the height is uh, smaller than with 4 by 3 aspect ratio by keeping the same width. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, how the calculator will work and it is a tool that you can easily use to find different parameters based on what you require in your installation.